Hello, welcome to episode 3 of the RabbitMQ EasyNet Q series. Today we're going to actually start to write some code. Uh, it's going to be very simple publishing messages to a queue on a RabbitMQ server. And uh, if you missed the last couple episodes, you might want to check those out. At least episode 2 shows you how to set up a RabbitMQ server in the first place, which I, which I won't cover here today. Okay, so we're going to start from just a blank slate here. This is Visual Studio. We're going to create a new console project. I'm going to call it Rabbit MQ Episode Episode Three. All right. So just a brand new out of the box console project. Nothing special here. The main class. Now everything I'm going to show you, you can do in a web app or. A WinForms app or what have you. Next I'm going to add a reference. I'm going to use NuGet. I could use the command line package manager console but I'll just use the UI here. It's a little more visual for the medium. So there is an official RabbitMQ client so that we're going to use and th the client is just for uh, sending messages uh, to the queue or receiving messages from the queue. That, that's, all, uh, that's all we need it for in this case so We'll add that reference there. And I'll just while I'm here, I'm going to go ahead and add a reference to JSON.net, um, which is a which we'll use for a serialization. Um, I'm not going to use it right away, but I'll just install it while I'm while I'm here in NuGet. Okay, and there's the JSON screen. All right. So to get started, the first thing we need to do is connect to the RabbitMQ server. So the way we do that is we'll say uh, give us a new connection factory and we'll set uh, our credentials on that so I still have the default guest for username and guest for password obviously you should change those in production and I'll also point point it to localhost I could point, point it to my uh, Linux machine over there uh, from last time um, but I'll just do localhost here. There's, there's no sense in uh, hopping across there. So that gives us a connection factory. The next thing we'll need to do is just get a connection from that. So we can just say varcon equals factory dot create connection. And there we have it. And then when we're done, we'll need to also uh, dispose the connection. So we'll just leave that at the bottom there. Okay, so we have a connection. Now if you remember, we went through the RabbitMQ uh, management UI the next thing is we'll need to create a channel. Now this is where it gets a little a little weird here with some of the naming. We'll call our variable channel um, but we'll actually call the create model method to give us a channel and if you if you notice here create model returns an implementation of the I model interface. So I mean it's kind of a strange thing they call this model here but in um, documentation sometimes referred to as a channel in the UI it's called a channel um, I, don't, I don't know. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. But uh, we'll also need to dispose that when we're done. Okay, so we have a channel. And the next thing we'll need to do, is, and this is kind of an op optional thing, but we will go ahead and uh, declare an exchange. Now, if we've already declared an exchange previously, we don't have to do this again. But it doesn't hurt to sort of reassert that the exchange is already there. Uh, I have not created one yet. Um, so we'll go ahead and do that for sure. Um, and it's always good to, like I said, declare this exchange e just unless you know for certain that it's already been declared. Um, so we'll do a direct type of exchange. There's other kinds as well, fan out, and we can also do headers or, or topic as well. But we'll just use direct for the purposes of this demo here. Um, the other thing you can do is you can also choose to make this a durable queue, which means that uh, I'm sorry, not a durable queue, a durable exchange, which means that if uh, uh, you know rab Rabbit will go down or a server will crash or something, that that exchange is saved to the disk and will be loaded up when the service starts again. And I think by default it is uh, not durable. And we'll just leave it like that. No, no big deal. Okay, we have a um, exchange declared now, so let's now create a queue. So we'll do that in the channel as well, and we'll uh, declare a queue. 
We'll call it episode 3Q. And it has some parameters here. So again, durable. We don't need to be durable again. Auto delete. We don't need that. Um, or sorry, exclusive. We don't need that. Auto delete. We don't need that either. And then as far as arguments go, we'll just pass a null to that. So one of the things, this is, this is kind of intimidating to me when I first started to use Rabbit and, and play with this uh, RabbitMQ client library, is that already I'm seeing just all kinds of parameters and possibilities and you know, what do I call the exchange, what do I call the queue, uh, you know, what kind of exchange type do I need, you know, do I need to be durable or not, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see that Rabbit is very, very configurable in the way we can use it. Um, so this is sort of a, a double-edged sword, uh, which I will try to address later on with the Easy Net Q library. So at this point, you can see that Rabbit is not very opinionated on how you use it. There's lots of different ways, as opposed to Easy Net Q we'll look at later, which is very opinionated and has a certain way of using it that will take care of all these underlying details for you. Okay, so, but marching on here, um, one thing we should do now is actually bind the queue to the exchange. And um, we can do that by saying, okay, here's the queue, it's the same name as I declared it as, and here is the exchange I want to bind it to, and then here is the routing key to which we will bind it. And I'm not going to get into routing too much in this series of videos. But it's a way you can use wildcards and naming to have Rabbit route the messages to the correct queue uh, for you. So you wouldn't necessarily have to specify um, a queue per se. You could just give it a routing key and the exchanges would, would take care of that, um, which is a, a pretty powerful tool. Uh, I'm not going to get into it very much uh, in this series, but definitely check that out. Okay, so finally, finally we have a queue, an exchange, a channel. We're ready to actually publish messages. So for this demo, I'm just going to publish uh, five uh, messages to the queue. So um, the way we publish a message to the queue is that we use the channel. And we say, I want to do a basic publish. And this is the exchange I want to publish it to, uh, episode 3 exchange. And here's the routing key I want to use to it, which is just going to match this one directly. I'm not using any wildcards or anything crazy. Um, basic properties. So if we pass something in here, it gives us, again, another opportunity to specify some properties of, the, uh, uh, of this publish event that we want to use. Um, so right now I'll just leave it null. I might, I might show those later on in the, in the video here. I might not. And then the last thing we need is the actual body of the message we're publishing. Now, if you notice here, Rabbit is expecting us to pass in a byte array. So that is what a Rabbit message consists of, is a byte array. So we need to construct that byte array somehow. So let's um, pretend we have a variable here called message body bytes. Okay? And so the message I want to send to put in a queue is going to be something like this. So message, um, let's do a string format. String format, say message number uh, x, and the message is going to be uh, something there. So we'll say i, just the index variable of the loop, and we'll say um, guid, whoops, what happened there? Guid dot new guid. So the message is going to be very simple. It's going to be message zero, GUID, message one, another GUID, and so on. Okay? And that's a string. So we have a string. We still don't have an array of bytes. So what we can do is we can use, um, let's see, we can actually define message body bytes, and we can use um, encoding, UTF-8 encoding, to say get the bytes of this message. All right? So now I've got a message in a string. I'm converting it into a byte array in UTF format, and I'm passing that uh, to this basic publish. That's the message it's going to publish. Okay? So uh, that's, that's it. I, this is, it seems like a lot, and it is, because there's so many different uh, knobs and, and uh, levers and parameters here. Um, but that is sort of the really simple hello world of how to put a 
message into the queue using the official RabbitMQ client. Okay, so I will go ahead and run this, and I should get a console window. Nothing happened. I, I meant to actually uh, write out those messages. So let me do that here, just so we can have something. Um, published message, and then it will just be the message. Okay, so we'll run it again. And up here you can see the console. Uh, we've created five messages with, uh, with GUIDs. So there's actually 10 messages in the queue right now because I've, I've run it twice. So we'll bring over the RabbitMQ management tool. And here is the dashboard. And you can see we've got some activity now. So this is just sort of a, a time index. And you can see how many messages have been queued up over a certain period of time. So here is our first initial five messages. Second five messages with a total of 10. Here's the message rate. You know, it spiked up two times when we ran that, uh, when we ran that um, console program. This will tell us some information about the node we've got. So we're, you know, how much memory we're taking, the disk space available to us, and so on. We'll go over to connections here. And I actually dispose the connection, so that's no longer there. If I left that connection open, it would still be here in the list. Go over to channels. Again, again channels, if you remember, is just sort of a lightweight uh, way to access connections. And that also disposed of that, so that's not listed here anymore. We go over to exchanges, and we see all the system exchanges went over last time. But we also see the new one, episode three exchange, which is right here. And I click on that, and I get a whole bunch of information about this exchange. I could delete the exchange if I wanted to. I could actually uh, have an interface to publish a message to that exchange. And we can see the bindings that we defined here. So here is the, the queue uh, and the routing key and arguments. And I could unbind or add additional bindings there. So that's the, that's the exchange. We'll go over to the queue. And here's the queue that we declared, episode three queue. And I could add additional queues if I wanted to. Um, but what might be more interesting, if I click on the queue that we uh, declared, you see that there's 10 messages in it. And this is very similar to the dashboard we saw uh, back in the overview, but this is for one specific queue. And we can look on here and see, are there any consumers attached to this queue? And there's not. We haven't gotten that far yet. We can see the bindings. Just another view of those. Um, we can actually publish a message to this queue if we wanted to. Uh, we can delete the queue or purge the queue. Delete the queue would just remove the queue completely. Purge would just empty out all the messages from it. We can, um, well, this just shows a documentation on how to move messages to another queue or uh, what have you. And finally, we can get messages. So this gives us a way to pull messages out of the queue. And the options here are requeue. So notice this, no, this up here, this warning. It says, getting messages from a queue is a destructive action. That means to pull a message out of the queue, you actually remove it from the queue. So this gives us the option of requeuing it. So once we pull it out, we'll put it back in. That's a useful debugging tool to just view a message, and then you, OK, I'm done with it, put it back in. We have some encoding options. And we can say, how many messages do I want to get? So we'll start with one. We'll get the message out. So here's message one. The server reports there are nine messages remaining in the queue, which is correct. We, of course, we know we requeued it, so now there's, there's 10 back in the queue still. So you see that happening up at this, uh, this chart here. And then the actual payload of the message, which uh, might not match the ones on the console anymore because we didn't print those out. But it's, uh, it's going to be very similar to what we created in the console app. Message 0 uh, with a GUID there. You can see that it's encoded as a string, and it's 48 bytes. So well done. So we'll get all 10 messages out, and we won't requeue them. This will sort of show us all the messages and purge the queue at the same time. So probably if we get to the last message, we'll see that it matches the last message we printed out on the console. Move this down here. You can see 74943, 74943. All right. And we should be down to zero messages now. So if we try to e get even one more message out, it'll tell us the queue is empty. There's nothing to, to get. Well, terrific.
but let's uh, make it a little more complex now. So all we did was pass a string as a message, and that might be useful in some situations, but what we really would like is a more uh, structured message. Um, you know, some sort of uh, def definition of data, uh, data structure, uh, data types, that sort of thing. So for instance, if I were to create a class, call it my message, and this, I could just have some arbitrary stuff in here, so maybe a string, um, um, let's see, shoe size, and then I could also put in um, address, and, and so on. But you get the idea there. It's, it's, an, it's a plain old .NET object, has a collection of properties, and I want to pass this as my message instead. Well, what we could do is instead of this string here, we could just say var message equals new my message, and we'll initialize that with uh, Grove City, Ohio, my, where I live. Name is Matt. Shoe size is, uh, I can never get this right, I think it's, I think it's 14, which makes it very hard to shop for shoes, let me tell you. Okay, so we've got a new message. It's not a string anymore. Now it is a type of my message, a, a C-sharp uh, object. So we can't pass that to encoding git bytes anymore. It doesn't know how to handle that. It's expecting a string. What we can do instead is, well, if you think about it, how do we take an instance of an object and convert it into a string? And th that process is known as serialization. So uh, you noticed earlier I got json.net uh, into the project. So I'm going to use json convert dot serialized object and pass in my message. Um, and that's not going to give us uh, bytes yet. It's going to give us the message body as a string. And so now we can say message body bytes. And this is going to be encoding UTF get bytes message body string. So finally we have we go from C sharp object to JSON serialization to a uh, byte array representation of that message. And now instead of printing out the message, I'll print out the message body as a string. So you can see that it's just plain old JSON. All right, so right now there's zero messages in the queue. When I run this console app, we'll see five more messages printed out and five more messages added to the queue. And now I probably could have put some variety in there because they're all the identical message now. I probably could have put a good in there or something, but uh, I think you get the idea. We'll go back over to the management tool. And we're back here on episode 3 queue. You can see that there's been some activity. We've got five queued messages. We can see the message rates. And uh, let's go and get one message and requeue it. And here's the message. The payload is a uh, JSON representation. Now, JSON is not required. You could use uh, XML. You could use, um, you know, if you want to form encode it or any sort of serialization you want to use. You can even do some sort of binary serialization. And all all Rabbit wants is a, a byte array, right? So anything you can convert to a byte array, you can send to Rabbit. However, using something like JSON or even XML has some benefits. Uh, one of them is that we're looking at right now. We can actually get a human readable payload as opposed to a binary representation, which we may not be able to um, divine much information from if we're, if we're debugging. Uh, JSON is relatively slim format uh, for, for passing objects while still being readable, so that has some benefits as opposed to XML or, or some other format. And finally, JSON is a format that a lot of different languages and tools can, can parse. Um, C Sharp can handle it, sure, we just showed that. Uh, Java, PHP, Ruby, all those languages can interpret um, and deserialize JSON string into an object. So if we were, for instance, communicating, you know, putting messages into the queue with C Sharp and pulling them out with PHP, that would be no problem because JSON is a format that uh, communicates well between those two systems. Okay, um, I think that's all I want to cover in this episode. 
just wanted to show uh, how uh, relatively straightforward it is, but it, it, there's some complexity here uh, when creating messages that we're going to address later on in the series. Thank you for watching.